Uh, in the previous lecture, we have uh, looked at some of the broad classifications on uh, magnetic materials and uh, we also looked at a, a clear divide between two sets of magnetic materials. One is soft and other one is hard magnetic materials and uh, we looked at some example of uh, soft magnetic materials like permalloy, um, alnico and uh, samarium cobalt and also some ferrites which show soft magnetic material uh, properties and uh, we also looked at a broad classification on uh, permanent magnets and uh, what are the criteria for a permanent magnet and uh, broad classification and we also looked at some of the alloys which are used mostly alloys and borates show this uh, permanent uh, magnet pro magnet property and also we looked at some of the ceramic materials which show this permanent magnet ma uh, property. Uh, in today's uh, lecture, I am going to deal further on some of the uh, examples of magnetic materials specifically related to magnetic recording media. And uh, lastly, I am going to touch on some magnetic phenomena which always comes out uh, when we specially deal with ferromagnetic materials. When we think of paramagnetic diamagnetic materials, um, we do not see so much of a manifestation as much as we deal with ferromagnetism. So, in ferromagnetic materials, there are certain issues that we need to have in mind, especially when we deal at low temperature. Therefore, those issues which are specifically important for ferromagnetic materials I would like to discuss in the later part of the lecture. So, let us quickly go through some of the examples that we saw in the previous lecture on magnetic materials. Uh, we looked at the uh, properties of permanent magnets, uh, the classification based on metal alloys or uh, intermetallic compounds especially those with the borides and then um, a ceramic ferrite which is called barium hexaferrite. Uh, now, the numbers that we usually look for um, in permanent magnet is those of uh, coercivity and the energy product. Energy product is defined as BH max and uh, this is uh, expressed in kilojoules or in mega uh, orsted and uh, the more the energy product better is the uh, behavior as a permanent magnet and as you would see here um, the intermetallics usually have a larger proportion of energy product compared to alloys and uh, we also have a substantial um, degree of contribution from uh, a ferrite which is a ceramic compound. Uh, ceramic compounds although they show this property but the fabrication is an intricate issue because it is often brittle therefore, you cannot sinter it. But this particular compound barium hexaferrite you can achieve up to 95 percent theoretical density therefore, it is possible to use this as a um, <coughs> permanent magnet. Not only um, its use uh, as a permanent magnet is reported, but uh, barium hexaferrite is also used in a thin film recording media. We will see that shortly. So, um, when we look at uh, the permanent magnet applications, we need to bear in mind these two parameters and the more the energy product better its application. Uh, we will quickly go back to all the compounds that we have seen and the range of applications that these magnetic materials hold. Um, these are a wide variety of uh, alloys that we can see and uh, alloy processing itself is a challenge and therefore, there are a lot of chemistry routes, material uh, chemistry route that is adopted to prepare magnetic materials especially uh, those of amorphous alloys. Because amorphous alloys is very difficult to prepare by conventional metallurgical means because uh, when you make alloy using a conventional uh, melting technique. Uh, you usually crystallize that alloy or they are uh, crystalline in nature, but amorphous alloys have to be suddenly quenched. Therefore, the um, bottom up approach is usually favored for making this material 
one of the most important route is uh, sonochemistry which we have seen in uh, one of the lectures in module 1. And then we need to understand in perspective that ceramic compounds mainly those which are iron based compounds find use uh, in applications as you would see here um, gamma Fe2O3 and CrO2 both are simple oxides, but they actually hold the magnetic recording media and even now uh, this hold the market. Although we have several other uh, candidates there, but when we think of tape material uh, still gamma Fe2O3 and CrO2 hold the potential and this is a multi billion dollar industry. Uh, which can never be compromised or substituted by any other material. Therefore, uh, we will study a little bit about this uh, two oxides in this lecture. And then we have seen yesterday how by changing the zinc ferrite either substituting with manganese or nickel you can change the resistivity by orders and this is also a soft material which is used in magnetic recording. And today I will also mention a little bit about uh, YIG which is a garnet and uh, hexafarite which is used uh, in uh, several other applications like microwave technology, uh, permanent magnets and uh, magnetic recording uh, media. If you look at this uh, samarium cobalt which is a very popular alloy, uh, you see this is a very tricky or a very complex structure. Although they crystallize in hexagonal symmetry, this is your <coughs> samarium cobalt compound and this is samarium 2 cobalt 17 and these are very highly ordered alloys and uh, if you look at this samarium cobalt uh, 5 it is exactly the base material for the samarium cobalt 17 except for some of the samarium atoms are replaced by this sort of dumbbell shaped copper cobalt cobalt um, dimer. Um, so, this is a very uh, intricate alloy that one has to engineer to prepare it carefully. Uh, so, so is uh, the case for neodymium iron borite where you can see the uh, structure is quite complex uh, one with a tetragonal unit cell. Um, now, preparing these compounds is a materials challenge and that is where materials chemistry is also a valued component. Um, most of these compounds are usually prepared by powder metallurgy and uh, they are um, melted um, and when they are melted uh, they are ground into micrometer sized particles and once you get the preferred dimension then these are actually oriented magnetically by an external magnetic field and then they are density densified by uh, further sintering. So, this is a very uh, uh, intricate procedure to get these permanent magnets. It is not a simple uh, grinding and heating, but it involves uh, a careful orientation of these grains along a particular axis. Mainly the magnetic field is applied along the z axis, so that these are elongated uh, particles along a preferred axis and uh, as, you, as you would see from the magnetic behavior they have in all these magnets they have a preferred easy axis of magnetization meaning it cannot be randomly magnetized only in a preferred direction you can magnetize it. Therefore, uh, preparation of these um, materials become very very uh, important and challenging. Uh, this is a ceramic ferrite or a ceramic magnet uh, which is called a barium hexafarite. Barium hexafarite is uh, named such a way because it is a solid solution of barium oxide and uh, 6 formula units of Fe2O3. You can take this and grind it to get a single phase like this, but normally to prepare a single phase material of barium hexafarite is very very difficult. Therefore, soft chemistry routes have been adopted very much to uh, <coughs> engineer this compound. What makes this uh, particular compound interesting is that it has a very high intrinsic coercivity of the order of 160 to 240 kilo amps per meter. So, 
because of this very high coercivity this is a very preferred compound for permanent magnetic materials. However, uh, when we try to look at the morphology if you look at the morphology of this um, barium hexafluoride, these are hexagonal platelets and not necessarily the desired shape for uh, recording media, but what happens is the easy axis of magnetization actually remains along the uh, uh, perpendicular direction to the plane of the uh, surface. As a result, they usually exhibit a perpendicular anisotropy. Particles may be platelet type, but the orientation of the magnetization will be perpendicular to the platelet morphology. As a result, this is usually used in perpendicular recording media. Not only that, uh, one hassle is there in using this uh, for recording media uh, as a memory uh, storage material, but the intrinsic uh, coercivity is a, uh, I, 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 is a problem because uh, such a high magnitude is not desired for magnetic uh, recording. So, if you want to use this for permanent magnet, you look for high coercivity when you want to use the same material for uh, recording you need to tailor down the coercivity. How do you do that? Usually we substitute the iron atoms with a little bit of cobalt or titanium immediately the coercivity comes down. So, with that you can still use this for a um, <coughs> recording purpose or for making a thin film record, um, recording media. Uh, and the point uh, that we need to bear in mind is uh, because of the perpendicular anisotropy this is one of the most preferred material which is not exhibited in any of the other soft ferrites. Although they are used for, for uh, cores uh, in, in several uh, uh, electrical applications. This is the only compound which is used for magnetic recording because of its perpendicular anisotropy. So, th that way this stands off as a most preferred uh, material compared to some of the alloys. Uh, we will come little bit more into uh, discussion on magnetic storage. Um, when we think about magnetic storage and applications of this magnetic materials, we need to understand in perspective there are two things. One is the material that is used for storing the memory, magnetic memory and the other one is the material that is used for reading the magnetic information. Both are important and to read the, the material that is stored you need a magnetic material and to store you need a magnetic material. So, in this uh, the materials chemistry again plays a very important uh, role and as you see uh, one of the important component in magnetic storage uh, is uh, uh, the read head. Uh, there are several ways that you can do that. One is uh, in one configuration the same material can write, in another configuration the material can read or it can do only one job, but uh, today, uh, today the new generation computers or storage devices usually have a head which is capable of writing as well as reading. So, these are popularly known as read and write heads. So, read write heads are also uh, specially designed based on new generation magnetic materials. Uh, so, this is to do with uh, the read head uh, which is currently used in most of our uh, recording applications and uh, the other one is the material that is used for storage. Um, if you look at the storage media there are two things that are prevalent now. We are in the age where we are using pen drives uh, and uh, few years back we were using CD and uh, we were using floppy disk. The floppy disk actually has a tape material compared to the CD. So, that was the transformation between a particulate magnetic media and a thin film magnetic media. So, that was a clear divide between this floppy disk and the CD uh, ROMs. Once the CDs came then the next question was how much I can condense this 
CDs into a smaller devices that is how the iPod came and the pen drives came. So, um, when we think about magnetic materials in all these applications you have two sets of uh, two generation of material which are used, but nevertheless when we think about the entertainment industry uh, it is all actually stored in tapes in high quality tapes. So, the material that is used for recording media is usually uh, alpha or uh, sorry gamma Fe 2 O 3 which is a low temperature form of iron oxide and this has a very particular specific uh, uh, manifestation um, or it has a very preferred orientation where it can uh, prove effective for um, <coughs> magnetic media. And if you are thinking about uh, a thin film magnetic recording media then we look for alloys and the most preferred one is cobalt platinum chromium alloy or cobalt chromium tantalum alloy. So, what you see as a hard disk is nothing but it is a material that is made out of alloy. What you see as a tape uh, material is nothing but uh, one which is made either of gamma Fe 2 O 3 or another popular one is CrO 2 which is uh, also a good tape material. So, uh, a particulate type and thin film type are the two generation uh, storage materials. Uh, this is a cassette uh, which I fondly uh, like to remember because if you uh, have gone a, got exposed to any of the uh, tape recorder which is no more available now in market. Tape recorders usually had a option to say whether it is CRO2 tape because for CRO2 tape the way the read head will re read or scan the tape will have a different sensitivity compared to gamma Fe 2 3 based tape materials. So, um, <coughs> this is a um, cassette which is a CRO2 um, cassette it is uh, called CRO2 90 minute virgin cassette as you can see uh, this is a very expensive one uh, sold in those days, but we have lot of advances in this storage media. Uh, so, a typical cassette tape has a material which is made of chromium dioxide. Chromium dioxide originally known as uh, a chromium dioxide tape, it is good high frequency sensitivity actually helps in minimizing on the tape noise because when you play the tapes you usually have a noise at the background coming and that is because of the sensitivity and uh, greatly that has been improvised uh, by application of CRO2 and uh, the <coughs> company which really marketed or made billions of dollars out of this CRO2 tape is the TDK company and even now the video tapes that are available uh, those are made out of a black compound. If you have time and just uh, take a look at the tape that is running in those video tapes you would see it is a dark one. Whereas, the audio tapes that were sold will be brown in color. So, the brown ones are usually gamma Fe 2 O 3 and the black ones are usually those made of CRO 2 and uh, the main contrast between these two is uh, gamma Fe 2 O 3 is easily made compared to, compared to CRO 2 therefore, CRO 2 is used for uh, very specific applications because to make CRO2 in a preferred geometry is very important. So, what is uh, what are the numbers that we need to remember regarding particulate, particulate magnetic recording media. Uh, the most important thing is the shape anisotropy of small elongated magnetic particles which will actually give you the required coercivity that is needed for um, superior recording performance. So, we need to um, know that when we talk about partic uh, particulate magnetic recording the most governing principle there is the shape anisotropy and uh, CRO2 therefore, can be successfully made using hydrothermal process. I have already dealt in one of my lectures in module 1 uh, where uh, hydrothermal um, conditions are the only preferred way to get CRO2 in a needle or acicular uh, shape. So, actually th th this is the way 
uh, you have the aspect ratio of these particles and that is exactly needed for the magnetic recording in a preferred direction and mainly because you need to smear this CRO2 particles on a tape material and they need to have a particular axis of orientation it cannot be random therefore for particulate medium which is usually a tape material which has a polymer base you prefer uh, needle shaped uh, CRO2 particles. So this is one of the criteria uh, for uh, tape applications the other one is uh, iron oxide that is used and uh, iron oxide again has a acicular or needle shaped uh, geometry and uh, acicular iron oxide particles are magnetically stable since the shape induced uh, uniaxial magnetic anisotropy is actually dominating the magnetocrystalline anisotropy therefore this is of a particular um, advantage over other materials. <coughs> this is a view graph to tell you what exactly I was talking about the shape anisotropy uh, this is the uh, desired form of uh, gamma Fe203 if you want to use it for tape because there are several um, chemical routes by which gamma Fe203 can be made but those usually end up with uh, this sort of irregular shaped or spherical shaped particles but those are not preferred for the tape applications so this is made specially out of a particular chemical process so if you if you really need to win over in terms of uh, applications we need to control the morphology and whenever we think about controlling the size we usually resort to a particular um, <coughs> chemical process and hydrothermal condition usually comes as a aid mainly because you use high pressure to force the morphology. Uh, the next uh, point that I want to drive home is uh, the use of this magnetic materials for thin film media. So thin film magnetic recording media usually is used for CDs and also for making the read heads. Read heads are never tape materials those are um, those are some iron cores which is coated with a particular magnetic material. So in addition to the composite particulate uh, magnetic recording media um, we have this uh, magnetic thin film media which actually has taken over the hard disk applications. So <coughs> the criteria for uh, thin film recording media is again similar to the um, tape material that we mentioned it should have magnetic hardness in terms of high coercivity high remnants magnetization and uh, high uh, coercivity squareness and also uh, the energy product um, also we, we need to have a low noise this would ensure a good application for thin film media uh, the candidates that are usually used are mostly uh, metals or alloys uh, the most preferred one is the cobalt based alloys and several processes have been developed not just the physical vapor deposition but if you want to make this in a larger scale the most convenient and inexpensive route is sputtering where you do not really look for a very high quality of epitaxy but just a particular orientation that is possible using sputtering because you can really make a large area deposition for this and mainly this has to be on a reel reel to reel basis so this is achieved using uh, vacuum technology um, so uh, just want to uh, make some sum up on these two um, range of materials for magnetic recording uh, the numbers that we are looking for is the coercive field and this coercive field is actually controlled by two parameters one is the magnetocrystalline anisotropy where your KL or KU dominates KL or KU is nothing but the magnetocrystalline anisotropy coefficients which are uh, specific for either a cubic or a uniaxial ferromagnet and uh, then your shape anisotropy also comes into picture so shape anisotropy and magnetocrystalline anisotropy they determine the value that you can generate out of it so the values that you generate for shape anisotropy is roughly of the order of 800 uh, kiloamps per meter so 
Um, these are the estimates uh, specifically mentioned for uh, small magnetic particles. The fascinating magnetic material which not only shows uh, the room temperature metallic property because this is the only oxide which is both ferromagnetic as well as it is metallic at room temperature. So, this is a very important oxide in magnetic recording. Not only that in the recent past we have observed another unique feature of this uh, CRO2 particles especially when you talk about small particles not as a thin film. If you look at the small particle you can see the resistivity of this uh, metal seems to be rising at low temperature. When they rise at low temperature that means the uh, the exchange coupling between the particles are affected because of the random orientation of this ferromagnetic domains. So, as a result um, if you try to look at the influence of magnetic field on CRO2 you can see here there is a substantial uh, increase in the magneto resistance ratio. In other words uh, CRO2 can be used not only for magnetic tape material, but it can also be used for uh, read head application mainly because it is responding to a field and it varies the resistance. How it varies the resistance at zero uh, field you see the resistance is at its maximum and at higher field the resistance almost drops down and this is the case with the uh, with change in temperature. As you would see here nearly 44 percent of negative magneto resistance ratio is achieved at uh, 4.2 Kelvin for this CRO2 particles and that is mainly happening because your transfer integral of one spin to the other spin is actually governed by cos theta ij which is the angle that is made between two spins. So, when you apply higher field and at low temperature you can actually bring about a collinear um, exchange between two uh, CRO2 particles. So, as a result you see a large drop in resistance even at very fairly low field. So, this is one of a very important uh, uh, breakthrough in the recent past on CRO2 uh, technology where CRO2 can uh, not just be used for as a tape material, but it can also be used for um, magnetic sensor applications. But the challenge in CRO2 is that it has to be prepared under extremely difficult conditions because if you take CRO3 which is a lab reagent and then you heat it all you would get is CR2O3 which is chromium trioxide and this is a green compound which is thermodynamically stable. So, your CRO3 6 uh, hexavalent compound comes to a trivalent compound and it is very difficult to promote this CR3 plus here to CR4 plus. That is why it has to be stabilized under high pressure condition. So, one of the most important way by which we can stabilize CRO2 is by hydrothermal process where you apply very high pressure to a starting <coughs> compound so that you can stabilize this phase. So, this is a very narrow range where you can stabilize CRO2 and the production of CRO2 has actually crippled the massive use of this in the recording medium and this is actually crystallizing in a uh, TeO2 rutile phase and you can see this is a typical x-ray pattern that you should get, but what you would see is a bit of CR2O3 coming as an impurity which is not a desired. So, to get 99.999 percent pure CRO2 is a challenge which is uh, the challenge for the materials chemist. <coughs> now, the other important application uh, in magnetic uh, memory uh, is bubble memory. What is this bubble memory? There are some compounds which actually in the presence of a external field will not show a, a systematic orientation of domains rather the domains will coalesce into a bubble and this bubble can actually move and in this bubble you can try to store the memory 
and uh, this is a cartoon which tells what is this bubble memory about. It forms a bubble where the read write chamber is placed and you can sense this um, magnetic information as a 0 1 bit and this is confined more in a circular motion not in a linear fashion that that is why it is called bubble memory. But this bubble memory actually has one uh, critical disadvantage because it takes more time to read the information as a result what was predicted to be a breakthrough in the early 70s later faded out because lot of new compounds started coming which uh, which was a, a pleasant replacement for this bubble memory devices. Um, some of the notable materials which are used as bubble memory uh, devices are permalloy. The first discovery was actually on permalloy and later ferrites were used. So, just run through some of the definition for what this bubble memory is about. It is a type of non-volatile computer memory that means um, it is non-volatile because even after you remove the magnetic field the magnetic information will still be there. It, whereas in non uh, in volatile memory devices with the moment you re, uh, remove the magnetic field the memory information is lost whereas in this magnetic uh, bubble memory devices it is a non volatile computer memory and uh, this actually uses a thin film magnetic material and this thin film magnetic material can be magnetized into small small bits or small bubbles and therefore you can actually hold the memory um, in each bubble and you can treat each of this bubble as a bit. So, that is why you, you call this as bubble and not domains. Each of this stores one bit of data. So, bubble memory started out in 1970s, but it failed because of the uh, commercial um, disadvantage. Uh, it was actually uh, Paul Charles who actually worked with permalloy who observed that uh, the domains can actually orient perpendicular to the plane of the film and uh, that gives an idea about a perpendicular uh, anisotropy. So, magnetic domains are in orthogonal directions with the film and a group of compound which showed this property is uh, from the ceramic ferrites uh, in other words oxides and they are called as orthoferrites. Orthoferrites are usually Re FeO3 where your um, Re is nothing but rare earth. So, we can talk about lanthanum uh, FeO3 or we can uh, say neodymium FeO3. These are called orthoferrites and one of the reason why they are called orthoferrites is because they, they show magnetization which is orthogonal to the thin film surface. And this is very peculiar because not all the magnetic compounds can show such a orientation. And uh, if you actually uh, try to channelize it by running wires on this thin film and uh, uh, in x y direction what you can do is you can generate uh, a array of this bubbles and th this bubbles can be used to store data. Um, it was uh, later by IBM uh, personnel uh, Bobek who could use magnetize small spots perpendicular to the surface and uh, could move the magnetic spots um, more uh, in whatever fashion uh, uh, you can design. And uh, some of the ways that you can do that uh, is seen in, in the next few slides. Um, the difference between the orthoferrite and the normal magnetic material is this. When you place the magnetic material between poles usually the opposite poles attract the the respective ones. So, in this case the shaded um, uh, colors tell tells you how a typical magnet would respond, but uh, orthoferrite will actually respond this way. It will not align opposite, but rather it will exhibit a dipole. So, it will uh, it will remain perpendicular to the pole and therefore, you can get a domain structure like this. A, bubble memory device or a material will actually show your domain in this form and these shaded areas or colored regions are or the bubbles perpendicular to the plane of the um, film. <coughs> so, now if you try to place it between uh, a poles of a magnet then you can see all these bubbles whatever you are seeing 
this coalesce into small bubbles and then if you try to use some small magnets then you can easily move these bubbles throughout. So, what you can do you can try to put some uh, circular wires and if you try to homogeneously apply a field then uh, if these are the shapes of your ferrites then you can actually uh, rotate these bubbles in any direction that you want. So, if you want this to go in a, a linear direction then this is the configuration that you need to keep. So, you can generate each of these red ones what you see here is nothing but a bubble that you can generate and you can push it along a particular direction. If you want a V shaped motion then you can design something like this. So, this is one, uh, one of the very distinct feature of a bubble memory device which is used for uh, storage application and to know whether uh, these are really homogeneous uh, you can get uh, micrographs of uh, these uh, orthopherites and you can see here this uh, MFM mapping can clearly give you the domains which are rich in ferromagnetic uh, uh, component and the regions which are rich in antiferromagnetic component. So, um, this can be uh, clearly studied and the phase homogeneity can be uh, modified. Another compound which is of interest is uh, garnet. Garnet is also used uh, in uh, storage media. This is believed to have no preferential direction of magnetization since the garnet is uh, cubic. So, it is not supposed to show uh, any um, isotropic uh, behavior. Uh, so, this was uh, again uh, used by Bobek to explore the um, application for a bubble memory uh, applications. Uh, one of the important feature of this garnet is that um, it is used more in uh, magnet optical devices. Uh, reason um, they can uh, this uh, YIG or yttrium ion garnet is actually uh, capable of rotating the plane of light. So, this can be used in magneto optical applications especially for Faraday effect where you can uh, you can use this more as a polarizer. So, if you use this polar uh, uh, light you can plane polarize it when you pass it through a polarizer made of YIG and in that case you can actually get a plane polarized light as a output therefore, you can study uh, the ferromagnetic response of any magnetic material. So, this is one of a very important application of garnet uh, that is used um, in today's uh, device. For example, notable application is uh, in the field of smoke. Uh, smoke is nothing but surface magneto optical care effect. This is a optical way of studying the care rotation. So, if a magnetic material uh, if a material is magnetic then it will actually rotate the plane polarized light in different directions. So, you will get a hysteresis like this similar to what you get in a VSM in a vibrating sample magnetometer or using a squid. If you see a hysteresis the same hysteresis can be generated using a plane polarized light and uh, this is specifically used for recording media. These are some of the view graphs of YIG shows how the ferromagnetic domains are aligned. This is a mapping uh, under magnetic uh, uh, imaging. This is a MFM image of uh, the same thing and uh, this is a unusual structure which is not as simple as the spinal structure or the uh, orthophorite structure. So, this has its own characteristics of uh, uh, crystal. and. Uh, uh, lastly, I would like to conclude on uh, the classification of this uh, magnetic materials with uh, uh, those which are uh, present generation materials used for read heads. Uh, this is a cartoon that you would uh, uh, see in an IBM website where uh, the, uh, the current read head uh, mechanism is very clearly um, mentioned and what is being used nowadays is a permalloy based uh, read head material that is um, nothing but a multi layer device. Uh, so, if you look at the read head structure this is where your read head is which is a very small spot and if you try to magnify that to see 
this is a multi layer which is uh, kept over um, inductive uh, coils and uh, the tip of this reed head is nothing but a multi layer which is of this uh, this geometry and this is made of several structures and uh, popularly popularly this is called as spin valve structure because with these it is possible for you to rotate the magnetic moment of the top layer. So, if your layer has to read your magnetic uh, memory or magnetic information in 0 1 bit then this top layer magnetic moment has to rotate very freely and that is why it is called spin valve it can easily be flipped. So, the spin valve is the current generation one and that is one of the reason why we are able to uh, store lot of memory even in a small uh, area. So, the field sensitivity of this spin valve is very very important and uh, the compound that really shows such a uh, read head capability or the spin valve device is nothing but uh, by layers of iron chromium or uh, nickel iron and copper sort of multi layers. The view graph that uh, we see here is nothing but a response of resistance normalized resistance over field and uh, what you see is a multi layer device which is made of iron chromium repeat of the order of 30 such by layers or 36 or 60 such by layers you can make where after every uh, 3 nanometer um, iron layer you see a 0.9 nanometer thin chromium layer. So, this is nothing but a <coughs> magnetic non magnetic bi layers. So, if you stack such magnetic non magnetic bi layers what you are effectively bringing into perspective is a ferromagnetic and a anti ferromagnetic coupling between two magnetic layers. So, if you have this sort of a anti ferromagnetic ferromagnetic coupling then in the presence of the field and in the absence of the field you see a change in the response and that is what we call it as magneto resistance. So, let us take the case of a simple bilayer like this at uh, zero field it has a very high resistance and at uh, at say 10 uh, kilo gauss you can see that the resistance has shifted. But if you control the size of this uh, interlayer from 1.8 nanometer if you go down to 0.9 nanometer you can see this fall is quite steep. So, thinner the non magnetic layer higher the magneto resistance response. So, what essentially it means is in the absence of field and in the presence of field I can control the resistance. So, that is why it is called as a magnetic sensor and this is precisely a, a sort of layer that is used in the current read head applications. So, this is um, actually taking over most of the attention compared to the traditional magnetic materials that are used in uh, the read head applications. So, what we have seen so far is the range of magnetic materials from ferrimagnetic to ferromagnetic we have seen some of the examples of diamagnetic materials and uh, we have largely looked at the different classification of compounds between hard and soft magnets and uh, some of the candidates for uh, magnetic storage media. Uh, in the next few minutes I am going to discuss with you about some of the problems one would encounter when we handle uh, ferromagnetic compounds. Although ferromagnetic compounds are a luxury to use in uh, several applications um, the way the uh, magnetic response uh, happens at a wide range of temperature say room temperature and low temperature actually brings about interesting physics and chemistry. So, I am going to <coughs> show uh, some of the magnetic phenomena which are embedded in system which we need to understand in perspective. Uh, some of these examples I, I will be discussing in detail uh, in the next module, but I will show only examples to highlight the point of magnetic phenomena. For example, one issue that often 
uh, we confront in ferromagnetic material is spin glass. It is not only seen in oxides but also in uh, other uh, metallic compounds. Uh, to show what the spin glass behavior is, uh, I take this popular uh, example of a phase diagram of lanthanum calcium manganate. If you uh, take lanthanum manganate and dope it with calcium, then uh, as a function of calcium, you can see the ferromagnetic response varies. In other words, the Curie temperature keeps on varying. So, there is a domain where you can see, this is the domain where you get a very strong ferromagnetic response. But as you keep on substituting calcium before and after, here and here, the ferromagnetic response vanishes completely and you get into uh, a sort of related phenomena. And that is exactly one of the phenomena is spin glass, which, uh, which you can actually see in this domain, spin glass. And what we also observe in the same ferromagnetic material is a charge ordering. These are all embedded along with the system and we can understand how to eliminate or what the origin of these mechanisms are. Now, what makes this lanthanum manganate more uh, interesting is that um, if you look at the band structure of this lanthanum manganate, these are uh, the uh, 2p bands from oxygen and this is the 3d band from manganese and you, you would see that uh, this is the situation when the material is above Tc, temperature is above the Curie temperature, this is the band structure. But once you go to temperature below Tc, when the system or the material is showing ferromagnetic nature, you can see that at the Fermi level, the upspin um, electrons or the D bands dominate over the uh, other subband, that is the low spin subband. So, as a result, this has high degree of spin polarization and this makes it very important for magnetic application, spin polarization. But what happens, this uh, uh, half metallicity or 100 percent spin polarization of one particular uh, carrier of electron is actually distorted by several other factors which happens in the lattice. Now, this is the cartoon which tells what is important about this lanthanum magnet and what is the magnetic phenomena usually we confront with. What is happening here is you have a manganese 3 plus and you have a manganese 4 plus. So, this manganese 3 plus has a eg electron which actually goes via oxygen 2p to manganese 4 plus and then this becomes a manganese 3 and this becomes manganese 4. Then the same electron can go reverse back which is called as double exchange ferromagnetism. And when this double exchange ferromagnetism happens, if you look at the AB plane which is nothing but manganese oxygen manganese oxygen manganese. So, this is your AB plane the ferromagnetism is actually ordered in this direction and this is a strong ferromagnet, it is a correlated for ferromagnetism. But when you go to low temperatures, what happens, uh, some of these ferromagnetic clusters can actually uh, disalign and they can get frozen into a cluster. Therefore, this can freeze uh, as it is as a disordered uh, state, but each of this can be grouped as a ferromagnetic domain. So, this is not completely it has lost ferromagnetism, but there is a competing interaction to the strongly ferromagnetic character that you would see at the Tc. So, at room temperature when it is a Q, uh, ferromagnet, this is the situation. When you go to low temperatures, you have competing uh, interactions which we call it as spin glass or as cluster glass. RS cluster glass. What happens? This is a ferromagnetic domain, this is a ferromagnet, but they are misaligned. As a result, you won't get a strong ferromagnetic loop. Rather, in the absence of a magnetic field, you would see that it is almost going towards zero. So, how do we see that in a typical magnetic uh, response? This is a M versus T uh, data, which shows 
there is a strong ferromagnetic transition. At low temperature there is no problem, uh, it is strongly ferromagnet and as you bring it to the um, Curie temperature it becomes a paramagnetic situation. So, this is a simple uh, M versus T response of a typical ferromagnetic compound. But what happens when you try to remove the field and cool the substance, what, uh, what is happening here is the same compound which is showing a very sharp transition here, when you do a ZFC that is zero field cooling, it immediately shows a response like this. So, what is this response? This is called as blocking temperature Tb and this is called as Tf which is called a freezing temperature. Why? Because at this place the ferromagnetic domains are totally frozen into a spin glass. It is more like a cluster glass and how do I know that? You, If you carefully look at the relative or the complementary response of this uh, uh, resistance versus temperature, you can see s corresponding to this transition, you can see a very clear metal insulated transition. But as you go down the temperature with the fields that are freezing, you can see the resistance is sharply going. So, it is showing metallicity in this regime which is corresponding to this uh, ferromagnetic ordering when it is getting cluster glass situation or when it is frozen as a spin glass, then you see that the uh, domains are uh, not coupling together or there is no exchange coupling between two domains. As a result, you can see the resistance is going. So, uh, when you have a complementary response between resistance and magnetization and when you see this set of typical behavior, then you can classify this as cluster glass. Now, what is the difference between a cluster glass and an antiferromagnet? In an antiferromagnet, you would exactly see the whole thing the moment sharply going to zero, which means even with very little field, it is it would not be possible for me to reverse the antiferromagnetic coupling. So, if you apply a, an external field, say 1000 Orsted or 500 Orsted, it is not possible to remove this antiferromagnetic coupling. Whereas, in spin glass or cluster glass, even with very little field, for example, it is mentioned here as 100 Orsted. With 100 Orsted, if I apply somewhere, if I sit uh, here at this temperature and apply 100 Orsted, then immediately this behavior comes back. So, this is the signature of a cluster glass or a spin glass. But why we are studying this? Why this is important? Because this can certainly bring about a candid response or influence on the electro, uh, electrical behavior. So, if you want your material to be uh, a metallic material down to 100 K or 50 K and if you want a magnetic response, then there should not be any spin glass behavior. In that case, we need to modify the composition so that we can get a strong ferromagnetic ordering. For example, if you take another uh, uh, compound or uh, another substituted compound of ruthenium lanthanum manganite, you can see between this and this there is a very small opening. It is not as this one. What it means is the spin glass behavior in this particular composition is very very less than this one. Therefore, the competing antiferromagnetic interactions are minimal in this case compared to this composition. So, this much of information we can try to understand. Um, for want of time, I will not be able to uh, discuss other issues, but uh, I just want to uh, sum up on this uh, cluster glass. Uh, here is another compound, but this compound is actually um, varied with different applied uh, external field and uh, the ZFC and FC curves are recorded here. As you would see here, if I do the ZFC FC curve at 2 Tesla, you hardly see any change between these two, which means the cluster glass influence is actually suppressed by external magnetic field. Whereas, if you lessen the external field to just 300 Orsted, then the opening becomes bigger 
and if you go still further if you just apply very meager magnetic field then you can see a very clear spin glass or cluster glass behavior coming. So, what it means is this anti ferromagnetic interactions can be largely minimized when you study this material under high magnetic field. Um, with this uh, I should be able to end because uh, I do not have much time to uh, cover other um, <coughs> examples. So, I would just uh, uh, sum up uh, with one particular uh, view graph that we have seen uh, some of the issues related to uh, magnetic phenomena in ferromagnets uh, especially the spin glass and I have also touched upon in this uh, lecture on uh, uh, special materials which are uh, specific to bubble mem memory devices and also storage uh, recording media.